It was too late. Diana wasn't sure how late it was, but she was damn sure it was too late for anyone to call. She hoped it was Mars's phone. Anyway, she just covered her face with a pillow and said thank you loudly when the call stopped after the fifth ring. She had just managed to get comfortable when the bell rang again. Damn it, she screamed, opening her eyes again. Martin, answer your damn. The word stopped suddenly when she realized that her husband was not in bed with her. She glanced at the clock, 3.37 a.m. As she picked up her phone from the nightstand and wondered why her husband wasn't there. He was there when they went to bed a few hours ago. Yes, hello? Hello, she muttered something into the phone. Is this Diana Miller? Yes, yes, that's true. Who is this? Are you Martin Miller's wife? Yes, for God's sake, yes. Who is this? Mrs. Miller, this is the emergency room at Northtown Medical Center. Your husband was brought in about an hour ago, and we had your contact information from the incident a year ago. He got into a car accident. Could you come over right now? My God, is he okay? I have no right to discuss his condition over the phone. Ma'am, please come. Yes, sure. I'll be there as soon as I can. She ran upstairs where her daughter was sleeping. Dallas, named after the city in which she was conceived, attended a local university but lived at home to save money. She enjoyed living in the dorms her freshman year, but as she got older, she realized that living close to campus would not be conducive to her studies. D. Wake up. Nothing. D. Wake up this time, pushing her lightly on the shoulder, still nothing. Dallas. Wake up. Dallas sat up straight in bed and tried to force her blurry eyes to focus. The light was on in the room. Dallas, your father was in an accident. He's in the emergency room. You need to get dressed. We have to go. She rolled out of bed and pulled her nightgown over her head, not thinking about the fact that at the age of 20 she was standing naked in front of her mother. For her part, Diana didn't even notice as she was too busy pulling out clothes for Dallas. Finally dressed, the two women drove to the hospital as quickly as possible. Dallas began bombarding her mother with questions about what happened, but Diana had no more information. It seemed like an eternity before they got there, but it was only about 10 minutes considering the lack of traffic. They were shown to Martin's room in the emergency department and were shocked by his condition. He was covered in bandages and clearly unconscious. They were given forms to fill out. Your grief does not free you from paperwork. Dallas moved her chair to be closer to her father. They stayed there for about an hour before a man and woman in police uniform entered. Good evening, ma'am. I'm Officer Gail Stanton, and this is my partner, Robert Hansen. We were the first to arrive at the scene. Any news on how he's doing? Nobody told us anything, Officer, Diana answered. Oh, this is my daughter, Dallas. We need to ask you a few questions. I know now it is not the right time, but it's better to do this as soon as possible. Certainly. Do you know what your husband was doing on the street at such a time? He was at home, and we went to bed together around 10 p.m. I didn't even know he was gone until the hospital called, ma'am, said Officer Stanton. Dallas, can you confirm this? Actually, yes. We watched a movie on TV, which ended at 10, and then we all went to bed. I saw Dad go into the bedroom with Mom. What movie? Something with Keanu Reeves, some kind of action movie Dad chose him. It was his turn. Did you have any special problems, maybe financial or marital? Nothing that all married couples haven't faced. No special problems. No, I just don't understand why he came out without my knowledge. Were the people in the other car hurt? That's the point, Mrs. Miller. It was a single car accident, and according to two witnesses, your husband's car was driving fine, and then quite suddenly accelerated straight into the large oak tree that sits at the corner of highways 121 and 288. There were no skid marks, and no one remembers seeing brake lights. Diana and Dallas looked at the officers when it became clear what they were suggesting. Are you implying that my husband did this on purpose? 
that he tried to commit suicide? We need to inspect the car for possible mechanical problems, and of course, we will need to talk to your husband when he comes to. But that's certainly one of the possibilities that we're looking at, yes. Are you sure there weren't any problems worth talking about, officers? I love my husband very much, and we have a wonderful marriage. No, there are no problems that I could think of. I'm sure it was just because he lost control or dozed off. It was already very late. I'm sure there is a reasonable explanation. Diana burst into tears and could not finish the sentence. Officer Stanton placed one of her cards on the table, asking them to call if they remembered anything else, and then left the hospital. Dallas closed the door to Martin's room. You didn't tell them, no, Dallas. I didn't, her mother replied. When the tears subsided, it's none of their business and has nothing to do with it. Your father didn't mind. Perhaps he will say something when they talk to him, then we'll see. The next few days passed slowly. Martin remained unconscious and was hospitalized while Diana and Dallas spent as much time there as they could. They were often there together and made sure that he was never left alone. Luckily, Diana knew Martin's boss and called him to tell him what had happened and that he would miss work. She carefully avoided saying anything that might make anyone think it could be a suicide attempt. The accident happened Saturday night and Martin eventually began showing signs of waking up Wednesday morning. By noon, his eyes were open, although he could only look around. Diana was there and noticed his eyes and came to the bed to reassure him that everything would be fine. A few seconds later, a nurse hurriedly entered the room. Something on the monitors warned her that the patient had woken up. Diana returned to her seat to let the nurse do her job. Soon more doctors entered the room to check on Martin. Diana took the opportunity to go outside to call Dallas and tell her that her father had woken up. Dallas didn't answer, so she left a voicemail. Soon most of the medical paraphernalia was removed. Martin's left arm was broken, but he was right-handed, and this should not have hampered him too much. His throat was sore from the tube, so he was given a whiteboard so he could communicate. The nurse read the message and asked him if he was sure. Martin nodded his head. The nurse quickly walked out into the hallway while the tests continued. Mrs. Miller, I must inform you that your husband has asked that you not be allowed back into his room, and my daughter too. What? He is my husband. I have the right to be there with him. I'm very sorry, Mrs. Miller, but the patient's wishes come first. Let me just talk to him. We'll work things out. Diana tried to get past the nurse, but couldn't get any closer, so she resorted to screaming, Martin. Martin, please talk to me. What's happening, Martin? Martin. Mrs. Miller, please stop screaming. You are disturbing our other patients. You can wait outside the room if you wish, but if we catch you trying to enter the room or making noise, we'll send you out of the building. Have I made myself clear? Yes, of course, Diana had no choice. Dallas finally made it to the hospital 45 minutes later. She found her mother sitting in a chair outside the room. Mom, why are you here? Your father forbade us to enter the room. Us? I mean, I understand why he banned you, but why me? What the hell does that mean, and why did it take you so long to get here? I had just woken up when Bradley came in to see how I was doing. We're kind of. God, you had sex with your boyfriend instead of being here for your father? I'm sorry, Mom, but he was unconscious when I left, Dallas answered in a tone that showed she wasn't sorry. It was really stressful, and I needed to relax. It worked really well. For what it's worth, when you have the opportunity, you should call too. I'm not going to do that, and let's not talk about it right now. It's disrespectful. The irony of the situation made Dallas chuckle. There was a knock on the door, followed by a tall, very attractive brunette. She was dressed professionally, but not like a doctor, although her badge identified her as an employee. Good morning, Mr. Miller. I'm Dr. Lasser, one of the hospital's mental health specialists. How are you feeling? As good as could be expected, I suppose. Nine days have passed since the accident. He regained the ability to speak. The whiteboard was a thing of the past. 
He asked about when he might be released and was never able to get a straight answer. Still, the hospital asked me to talk to you. This is fine. I have a choice, not if you want to return home soon. I really have to free you to let you go, the psychiatrist answered with a puzzled smile on her face. Then let's begin, Dr. Lasser pulled one of the chairs up to the bed and sat down. Crossing her long legs, it took her a few minutes to look through the papers. Okay, so you were brought in a little over a week ago after an accident, a collision with a large tree. I also see that you have banned your wife and daughter from visiting you, and I suspect that these things are somehow connected. I see, Martin replied. She cheated on me. Unfortunately, this is a common occurrence these days, although it rarely leads to such a reaction. Is there more to this? Martin was silent for several minutes. He really didn't want to talk about it, especially with a pretty woman. He wondered if they had a guy, a really old guy, that he could talk to. Dr. Lasser waited patiently. This wasn't the first time she had to wait for someone to force herself to speak. Her patience was rewarded. I suffered from depression. I think, nothing that was diagnosed or anything like that. I was just, well, like I said, depressed from something specific or just in general, I think. I couldn't, since I didn't have erections a little more than a year after the previous accident, right? Of course, she knew she probably had his entire medical history in her hands. She just wanted to make him say it. Right, it wasn't even an accident. I was in the back seat, my boss was in the passenger seat, and his boss was driving. We were hit from behind. There were no airbags or even very large damage, but I was not prepared for that. I hit my head on the seat in front of me. I'm guessing that was the reason. The report says you suffered a blow and a mild concussion. My doctors couldn't explain it. None of the drugs worked at all. They ran a bunch of tests, some multiple times, and the best explanation I got was that something happened and part of my brain was damaged, so you couldn't achieve erections, which led to your wife eventually becoming dissatisfied with your sex life, which in turn led to her having an affair. This eventually wore you down and led to the events of that evening. Is this something like this in a nutshell? Yes. And how long did it take before your wife did this? Seven or eight months, I think. We tried to take care of things in other ways. Well, you know, there are certain kinds of helpers. Yes, I understand how it works, Mr. Miller. I've already had sex before, of course. Sorry, I just feel a little uneasy. Um, anyway, at first everything was fine, and we hoped that my ability would return. We'd talk about spending the entire weekend in bed, having a really good time. Of course, this never happened. Eventually, this went on for so long that she decided to take care of her needs elsewhere. Did she discuss this with you beforehand? No, I found out about this when I came home from work early. Cliché, say, I know. And not only was she at home with her lover, but my daughter and her boyfriend were there too. Did they do it as a group? Dr. Lasser asked, shock evident in her voice. No, thank God. Diana and Bill were in the bedroom, and Dallas and Brad were in the living room. That's how I found out my wife was cheating on me, and my daughter knew about it and apparently approved, which explains why your daughter was also banned. Yes. Oh, and if I haven't mentioned it before, Bill, Brad's father, we knew him before by chance as the father of our daughter's boyfriend. I later learned that it was the daughter who suggested Bill to her mother. This is another blow. Did you confront them? Well, not quite. Perhaps if Dallas hadn't been there, I would have run into Diana, but I'd already seen enough of my daughter's anatomy. Then I left. How did the explanation go then? Not what I expected. She was sorry that I knew this, but, but she made it clear that if I could not take care of her, she would delegate it to someone else, and she preferred a full-time partner, as she put it to having every time to find someone new. Bill was single and had similar needs, so he was her choice. Your actions? What could I do? She was right about me not being able to have sex. It wasn't her fault that I couldn't, so she did what she had to do. What if, hypothetically, she asked you in advance, would you agree? 
You know, I thought about it a lot, and part of me wanted to say that I would agree because I loved her and wanted her to be happy. But I don't think I would be happy with that. We made vows, we made promises, and one of them was in sickness or in health. I wouldn't do that to her, so I couldn't handle her doing that to me. Obviously, she continued to see him. And now that I knew about it, she was less reserved about it. I don't know if she started doing it more often since I don't know how often they did it before, but where before it was limited to the day when I was at work, it now included trips to the store on the weekends, and part of that time was clearly spent with Bill. It must have been difficult. Difficult? That doesn't even begin to describe the situation. But again, I didn't think I could do anything. She deserved a sex life, but I couldn't provide it, and it was all killing me. Tell me about the night when the accident happened. The whole family watched the film on TV. I kept my pain, that is emotional pain, to myself. I think it was a mistake, but I didn't want to burden Diana or Dallas. They kissed and hugged goodnight while I got a goodnight from Dallas. I think it was at that moment that I realized that she had completely lost respect for me as a father and as a man. I could hardly blame her since I didn't respect myself either. I got ready for bed as usual. Diana did the same. Everything was the same as always, every night, the same thing. I waited until Diana was asleep, then got dressed and grabbed my wallet and keys. I went upstairs and looked into Dallas's room. She was also sleeping. I blew her a kiss and said goodbye. I went and got into my car. I knew there were airbags there, but I thought if I hit it hard enough, it wouldn't matter. I didn't have a specific plan. I just drove around the area. I knew about the big oak tree, drove past it for the first time, and realized that there were no obstacles and a fairly direct approach. They sat in silence for a few minutes, both letting the story process in their minds. Finally, the doctor spoke, Mr. Miller, I want to thank you for being so open and honest with me. That's a great rarity. I'm going to let you rest a little and think about what you've told me. Is it okay if I come back tomorrow? I'm not going anywhere, he said sarcastically. They shook hands, and Dr. Lasser left the room. Martin took his mobile phone, which he had left at home that night and which Diana had brought him before he told her not to, and answered several messages and emails. He also informed his boss of the latest news. Then he closed his eyes and tried to get some sleep. Returning home, Diana tried to control herself. She got the impression that Marty was fine with her meeting bill, that he had given it to her as a gift because he loved her so much. Even when she first heard about the incident, she no longer believed it was an accident. She was sure it had nothing to do with it, but now she wasn't so sure. She suspected the police were talking to her husband, but hoped he didn't say anything about her relationship with Bill. The police didn't contact her again, since sex outside of marriage isn't technically a crime, so maybe they just thought it was a suicide attempt and left it at that. Case closed. However, he never really minded, isn't it? If so, she couldn't remember it, and besides, she wasn't going to live a life of celibacy just because some idiot decided to frame her husband's boss. This wasn't what she signed up for, and she sure as hell wasn't agreeing to it now. Once Marty returned home, she would try to be more aware of his feelings, more observant in her relationship with Bill, but there was no way she was going to give up. The next morning, as promised, Dr. Lasser came in. Marty noticed the external changes in the good doctor's outfit. Alas, little Marty remained a recluse. How are you feeling this morning, Mr. Miller? Not much has changed since yesterday, document ready to go home, but I think it's up to you. Well, partially, but you are detained for 72 hours, and as required by state law, the countdown of this time begins with our conversation yesterday, so at least two more days. It's okay, document. At least the food here isn't that bad. They laugh together, an oldie but a goodie. Dr. Lasser noted, I'm glad to see that you are joking. Me too. It's been a long time, and by time I mean months since I felt like myself. I used to be a big joker, to the point where I sometimes got on Dallas's nerves. Have you had any other bad thoughts? Can we find any more dark alleys in your mind? 
You know, Doc, this is not the case. I spent a year feeling pretty depressed and have been depressed for the last few months. I don't feel it anymore. It gave way to anger and disappointment. Disappointed with Diana and Dallas, of course, more with Diana, but mostly disappointed with myself for not standing up for myself, for not letting my wife know that what she was doing was unacceptable. Do you intend to take this position now? Undoubtedly. While I admit I'm tempted to just get a divorce, I have to accept some of the blame for letting her get over me. But if she agrees to stop seeing Bill, then I'm ready to see a counselor and try to repair our marriage. I can appreciate your determination, Mr. Miller. I rarely see such a turnaround happen so quickly. I had a lot of time to think while I was lying here before we met. I appreciate that you gave me the opportunity to express this, to tell someone about it. This allowed me to focus on my thoughts. Excellent, Mr. Miller. Simply excellent. In that case, I'm going to finish today. I'll stop by tomorrow for one last chat, but I see no reason why. You can't leave on schedule. I'm looking forward to it, document. Diana and Dallas were there to pick him up when he was released. If he was going to try to change things, he needed to start by acting as if things were going to change. The airbags were surprisingly effective, much more effective than Marty expected. The worst part was the concussion he suffered, which required him to spend a lot of time resting and relaxing in the dark. The TV was turned off, and some soft music was playing in the background. His wife and daughter fawned over him. Everything was fine for a little over a week until Diana announced that she needed to go shopping. No, Marty said calmly. What? Diana answered, confused. Used Marty, there are things we need, including some of your healing creams. Make a list for Dallas, she can go. Why are you dragging me into this, Dad? Besides, I have plans to see Bradley. Then you have an incentive to finish your shopping quickly, don't you? Diana, list. This is funny, Martin. You can't just come home and turn everything upside down. Dallas has plans, and I go to the store, and that's final. Are you taking me for a fool, Diana? Fool? No, Marty, of course not. Why are you asking about this? You think I don't understand that these shopping trips are an excuse to see Bill? I never forgot to come home with groceries, Martin, never. Yes, and this is an excellent cover, but you've been gone too long. And not only that, but I can see it in you, in your eyes when you don't look at me, in your clothes when they don't look quite right, in your makeup, it's always a little different. At least you spent some of your time with Bill, and that won't happen anymore. The shock in Diana's eyes was obvious, and Dallas suddenly felt a little more respect for her father. Marty, please, we have already discussed this. Now, I will do my best to be more careful. Apparently, I've become a little too relaxed about my meetings, but, of course, I won't give up on it. I have the right to have a sex life, and I intend to have one. So, our vows didn't mean anything? Leave everyone else in sickness and in health? Well, that's part of the disease, and you don't leave others behind. But you will do it. Right now, you stop seeing Bill, and we go to a counselor to repair our marriage. Or not, and I'll call the divorce lawyer on Monday. You won't do this, Martin Miller. Don't you dare threaten me. If I could have sex with you and only you, I would, but I can't. And it's not my fault. I didn't cause the accident. I wasn't even there. Suddenly, because I had nothing to do with it, my sex life is over and I should just accept it. It will not happen. So, I'm going to go shopping, see Bill, and take care of my needs. If you want to talk about it later tonight, we can do that, but don't you dare think you can dictate to me what I can and can't do. Without waiting for another word from her husband, Diana walked out of her front door, closing it with a crash that rattled the window. The silence was deafening. Father and daughter looked at each other, and then Marty went to his bedroom. For the first time in her life, Dallas Miller was worried about the future of her family, about her parents' marriage. Dad never really confronted Mom, but nothing that serious had ever happened between them. 
But deciding that this was between them and she could not do anything, she put herself in order and went to meet Bradley. Some part of Diana hoped Marty would never recover because she wasn't sure she'd ever be able to give up on Bill. Bill was aggressive. Bill was strong. He didn't think what he was doing had hurt her. He just did it. Marty was always so gentle, so attentive, so Marty. It was already getting dark outside when Dallas returned home. She found her father resting in his bedroom. There was a faint glow, which she realized was coming from the bathroom where the light was on and the door was slightly open. She realized that her father wanted some light, but none of the lamps in the room burned that low. Dad? He stood with his back to her and did not turn but answered, Dallas? I'm sorry. This caught his attention, so he carefully sat up in bed and turned to see his daughter quietly crying in the doorway. What are you talking about? He had stopped calling her all the little pet names he had previously used after he found out that she had helped her mother find a lover, and he was hesitant to do so now, even though she was in tears. He couldn't help but think it was all a setup. Dallas walked closer until she was right at the foot of the bed. I'm sorry for what I did. I was just trying to help my mom, you know? She was so upset about what you had to go through and that you couldn't, their gazes met for a moment. Well, you know what you couldn't, and Bradley's father had been going through the same thing ever since Mrs. Coyle died. Bradley says his dad always talks about how much he misses her, especially nearby. I thought they could, you know, take care of each other. I'm sorry to say, but I never thought about how this would affect you. Is that what you did that night? Marty was surprised by this sudden outpouring from his daughter. It might have been a ruse, but he had to take her confession at face value. If he was fooled, offended, deceived again, then so be it. Mostly, yes. I think I was very depressed, just because I couldn't, well, you know what I couldn't do. Father and daughter made eye contact again, this time exchanging a brief smile. But it's over now, Delhi. I'm not going to do this again. I hope not. I need you. Are you going to divorce your mom? I haven't made any final decisions yet, honey, but I don't see any other outcome unless she stops seeing Bill. But keep it to yourself. She has to change because she wants to, not because she has to, okay? Dad, I'm going to go upstairs. Oh, I broke up with Bradley tonight. Marty tried to keep the smile off his face. He had never particularly liked the boy, but this surprised him because she seemed to have a crush on him or was in love. Why? Marty asked, interested in this turn of events. Because, Dallas began, then paused to think. Because my dad once told me that he wasn't good enough for me, and I finally realized that he was right. I finally realized that my dad was right about a lot of things. A smile appeared on Marty's lips as he realized that his little girl had grown a lot today. Dallas walked up to her father, hugged him, and realized that it was the first hug they had shared in a very long time. They finally pulled away, smiled at each other, then Marty watched as Dallas silently left the room and went upstairs. Before Marty heard his daughter's bedroom door close, he heard Diana chirp as she locked her car. The good feelings that had just filled him with joy disappeared in an instant. He lay down again and closed his eyes. A few moments later, Diana entered the bedroom. She took a shower at Bill's, and Marty suggested that it was better for her to come back freshly washed rather than smelling like sex. Could you help with the groceries, please? Diana asked. Are there really any groceries there? Marty quipped, sitting down. Yes, Marty, I told you I was going grocery shopping, and I went. Marty pulled the bags out of the car and dumped them on the counter. He noticed that there were no refrigerated or frozen foods. He also found a receipt, and the timestamp showed that she had left the grocery store almost two hours ago. First, I went shopping, and then I went to see Bill, Diana explained. As it turned out, even though Marty knew this would happen, the evidence in front of him hurt. After putting his things away, Marty headed to the bedroom without saying another word. He wondered if he should even bring this up again. It really didn't make any sense. Diana made it clear what she intended to do, so the next step was his response. 
Something had to change. Did you want to talk a little more? Asked his wife in a tone that said it wouldn't do any good. No, Diana, you have made your position clear. Diana's expression and tone softened. She loved her husband and did not want to lose him. He was her best friend and the person she most enjoyed spending time with. She really didn't think that organizing her own sexual gratification, given the circumstances, should be a problem, and she hoped that Marty would eventually feel the same way. Diana nodded approvingly and headed to her closet to get dressed. She had thought about returning to some of the intimacy with her husband that she had been missing, but tonight was not that evening. By the time she changed for bed, Marty was already asleep, or at least he was good at pretending. The divorce did not go smoothly. Diana was furious when the papers were submitted. Marty was kind enough to send them home and made it a point to be with Dallas after moving into the guest room that was upstairs next to Dallas's room. Diana fought stubbornly against divorce. She hired a very aggressive lawyer, and he did everything possible. They even tried to declare him mentally incompetent, citing a suicide attempt. Marty, anticipating that she might try something similar and because he thought it would be a good idea, entered counseling the same week the paperwork was filed. The psychologist he saw was reputable, and when he testified that Marty was definitely no longer at risk for suicide, the judge agreed. The fight could have gone on much longer, but just when Diana seemed about to step on his heels, Dallas intervened. She made it clear to her mother that they were wrong, that Diana's needs did not outweigh the vows and promises she had made. Life isn't always fair, and she had to be there for her husband and suffer by his side. Dallas also made it clear that any further resistance would damage their future mother-daughter relationship, possibly forever. Faced with the loss of both her husband and daughter, Diana felt she had no choice and abandoned her opposition to the divorce. The house was sold. Marty agreed to alimony for several years, knowing the judge would order it anyway. Diana rented an apartment with two bedrooms not far from her work, and she could work full-time. Eight months after the divorce was final, but the divorce left her bitter, especially when Bill let her know they were over. It seemed like there were a couple more women he slept with, and Diana lost her attraction once she was no longer married. Dallas continued to attend college, alternately staying with both parents, although over time, Diana began to play the victim and continued to blame Marty for the divorce. Once again, when Dallas heard her mother say, if only you were more understanding, she yelled at her mother, did you think about dad? Marty walked into the dimly lit club around 10 p.m. It was Friday night, and he just wanted to get out of the house. He was just looking for a short-term pleasant pastime. He wanted to have a few drinks and maybe dance. He sat down at the bar and ordered a rum and coke. As he sipped his drink, he looked around the crowd and noticed a woman at the far end of the bar who looked familiar, but he couldn't quite place his finger on it. An almost empty glass of wine stood in front of her. Her hair was dark brown and long, and her dress barely covered her breasts. Marty looked at her closely and remembered. A small smile appeared on his lips as he took his drink and walked towards the woman. She looked at him just as he approached her. Dr. Lasser, he said. She looked into his eyes and studied his face for a moment, but did not immediately show any recognition, and Marty thought that perhaps he was mistaken. I'm not Dr. Lasser at the hospital. Here in the real world, I'm Vicky. But I'm afraid you're putting me at a disadvantage. It's been some time, and I'm sure that you communicate with many more patients than I do with excellent psychologists. I'm much better at names than faces. Test me, Martin Miller. Vicky considered the name for a minute, and Marty waited patiently for her to admit defeat. He watched her carefully, and if you had asked him later, he would have sworn that he actually saw how in her brain caught the fire bulb. Ah, uh, Mr. Miller. An unfaithful wife and a rather sudden collision with a tree, if I'm not mistaken. You're not mistaken, and I'm amazed we only spoke twice over a year ago, hell, almost two years ago. It's luck. Want to join me? Marty sat down, motioning for the bartender to refill their glasses. Thank you, I'm pleased. So, what brings you here tonight? Are you dating someone? Marty asked. 
I'm trying, Vicky replied, and the sparkle in her eyes made it clear what she meant. Really? I thought I remembered a rather impressive stone on your finger. Perhaps it was so? It wasn't long before my divorce was final. I wore my rings while trying to convince my husband, sorry, ex-husband, that he really had nothing in common with a 20-year-old cashier other than wanting one of her friends to join them in bed. I'm afraid I didn't succeed. Oh my God, are they still together? This may come as a bit of a surprise to you, Mr. Miller, but after my divorce was finalized, I completely lost interest in Wayne's marital status. I don't have the slightest idea. Certainly, it was a stupid question, and please call me Marty, or Martin, or even in anything but Mr. Miller. What did your wife call you, Marty? Well, Martin. Could you take me to the dance floor? I will, Martin. Marty asked the bartender to keep their drinks safe behind the bar, then took Vicky by the hand and led her to the dance floor. It was a fast dance, and they quickly fell into a rhythm. This song was followed by another fast song, and then a slower song began. They remained on the floor the entire time, snuggling together to the slow music. Vicky wrapped her arms around Martin's neck while his hands were pressed tightly to her back. Being a guy, Martin immediately noticed the lack of a bra. They looked into each other's eyes for a moment before Vicky laid her head on his shoulder. They still didn't let go of their embrace when the second song started. Martin was lost in the sensations of this beautiful, soft woman who smelled absolutely amazing. When the song ended, Vicky took advantage of the slight drop in the music volume to say a few words. Martin, I'm already tired of dancing, but I'm also very lonely, if you know what I mean, she whispered in his ear. How about you take me home and do something about it? Martin took her hand and walked back to the bar, paid the bill, and let the bartender know they didn't need any more drinks. He didn't seem surprised. She arrived at the club in an Uber, so they got into his car, and Martin drove back to the apartment. Vicky, maybe I'm asking this a little late, but how much did you drink? It was my first glass of wine at the bar when you walked up. What's the question? Because I don't take advantage of drunk women. Don't worry about it, Martin. They drove into his underground garage and took the elevator to his floor. Vicky hung on him all this time, and they managed to kiss passionately several times as soon as the door closed. Oh my God, Vicky, you are stunning. Thank you, Martin, but what are you just going to watch? Definitely not just to watch. Then show me your bedroom. Martin took her hand and led her down the corridor. Luckily, Dallas was visiting her mother that weekend. I hope you have condoms, Vicky said. Martin did have a small supply in his bedside drawer, and he pulled them out, placing them on the nightstand. They finally came to their senses after more than an hour of continuous and great sex. Martin was lying on his back, Vicky was lying on her left side, and snuggled to him. They weren't quite asleep, but they were relaxed in that strange limbo between sleep and wakeful. Martin felt rather than saw Vicky raise her head. Martin, I just remembered that there was a certain erectile dysfunction in this story, so I was wondering if you would remember this wonderful, obviously this is no longer a problem. What happened? A couple of months after the oak incident, I started to feel, well, a tingling sensation, how shall I put it? This is what I imagine it will feel like when a paralyzed limb begins to recover. This went on for several weeks. Were you still married? What did you say to her officially? Still married, yes, but we have been living apart for several weeks, and no, I didn't say anything. It was none of her business. Over the next few months, I started getting morning erections more and more often, and even sometimes during the day. After eight or nine months, everything was pretty much back to normal. What did the doctors say? They didn't have an answer, at least not a serious one. They ran all sorts of tests and scans and compared them to the same ones I had when it wasn't working and they couldn't point to anything. They ultimately attributed it to a quirk of the brain. They think hitting the tree solved the problem, they just don't know. Perhaps it was the tree, or perhaps it was a brain that had just completely healed. There's no way to know. Well then, I'm lucky, I guess. 
It's okay if I stay the night? Well, are we going to have sex again in the morning and then have breakfast together? They settled down to sleep, but Martin had one more question. Vicky M., do you think you're ready for a serious relationship? There was a long pause, and Martin was afraid that he had made a mistake and scared her. He half expected her to get out of bed and ask for a ride home. There was no doubt about her attraction to him, and it's not just her physical beauty. She was smart, and he enjoyed her company. This, of course, was not love yet, but after the divorce, she was the first woman he seriously thought about. Can we talk about this in the morning? Certainly. Good night, Vicky. Good night, Martin. Vicky woke up before Martin. He looked peaceful, so she just let him sleep. She used his shower and then went to the kitchen to see what she could make for breakfast. Martin's question before going to bed took her by surprise. It wasn't that she wasn't attracted to him, but really, she was just focused on having a good time. She had been telling herself for months that she didn't need a man in her life, and on some level, that was true. She had a good job and some great friends, so she didn't need a man. But if she was completely honest with herself, she really wanted it. But what would a decent guy say after she tells him the truth? Martin was awakened by the smell of something cooking. He stumbled into the kitchen to find that Vicky had used his shirt from last night and found the apron he kept in his closet. I was going to invite you to breakfast. It's too late now. You can invite me to lunch. Go quickly, receive a shower, and breakfast will be ready. Ten minutes later, Martin joined Vicky in the kitchen just as she was setting up plates on the table. There was an omelet, a couple of sausages, and a piece of buttered toast. I didn't know I had sausages. They were in the freezer. I hope it's edible. Martin took a bite and said it was delicious. Breakfast itself was relatively quiet, with Martin taking charge of cleaning the kitchen since Vicky had done him the courtesy of preparing the food. They chatted about nothing in particular until it was done, and when everything was put in the dishwasher, he turned to Vicky. Are you ready to talk, mostly listen, Vicky? I don't want to put you in a difficult position or interfere in your affairs. If you're not interested in anything other than getting laid, then this is what it is. You don't owe me anything. I know. I just need to tell you something. And can we do it in the bedroom? I will be more comfortable there. They held hands and walked into the bedroom and sat on the bed facing each other. Vicky squeezed both Martin's hands tightly. Martin, I know that we really only met last night, at least in the real world. I think you're a great guy, and I definitely like you. But there's something I need to tell you. I said that my husband left me for a 20-year-old girl, and it's true, but that's not the whole story. The main reason he left me is because I can't have children. He wanted children and went in search of someone who could give them to him. He didn't want to adopt a child. He viewed not having children of his own as a kind of failure, and I was the reason for it. And no, I really have no idea how he feels after the divorce. I'm over 40. I have an adult daughter. I wouldn't mind children, but that's not a barrier. Glad to hear that. Another thing I want you to know, well, at least I want to be honest. I'm not too proud of it. After the divorce was final, I felt pretty bad about myself. I was getting older and had just lost my husband to a woman almost half my age. I'm 37, if you're wondering. I'm interested, but in no case was I going to ask. They both chuckled slightly. I also felt, well, unfinished, I guess is the best word. To tell the truth, I didn't feel like a woman at all. How can you be a woman and not be able to have children? I know what you're thinking, but that's exactly how I felt at the time. So I decided to prove that I am a woman. And if I couldn't be a woman having children, then I was going to be a woman satisfying men, mostly anonymous. But there were a lot of them. I called myself Angela and never refused to go home with someone when I wanted. This went on for several months until I realized that this was self-destructive behavior and started seeing a therapist. Even then, I continued to do it, albeit less frequently, until I finally reached a point in my life where I could stop. Isn't that what you were doing last night? 
Martin asked carefully. He didn't judge and didn't want her to think so, but last night, she was a cougar on the hunt. There was no doubt about it. Yes, it was. So I have needs as a woman, and I sometimes go out to satisfy them. But if before, I usually left with the one who called me first, now I am selective about who I choose. There were many nights when I came home alone and, you know, took care of everything myself. I guess I should be glad I passed the test. Of course, Martin, I really enjoy spending time with you, and to answer your question, I would really like to explore more. But I want to be honest about what I've experienced. I actually checked, and luckily, I didn't catch anything, which was incredibly lucky. I don't need birth control, but I can get a note from my doctor if need proof. Assuming you're willing to try, I'd like us both to get tested and agree to be exclusive. Martin sat in silence for several minutes. Vicky waited restlessly but patiently. Finally, he was ready to answer. Vicky, thank you for your honesty. I know it was very difficult. I think I owe you the same. Our experience is not too different. After my divorce, I was glad I went through with it but felt depressed about my inability. I had no idea how I would ever have a woman and I faced the prospect of living completely alone. My therapist pointed out that as we get older, many women lose interest in sexual intercourse and prefer non-sexual affection. I thought I would have to find a woman much older than me or wait a few years. When I started getting an erection again, and even when it seemed like everything was back to normal, I wasn't in the best condition. And just as you felt that you needed to prove that you were a woman, I felt that I needed to prove that I was a man. I went out a lot to find women to bed, proving, at least in my mind, what a stud I was. I was no more picky than you. Some women were kind of like, well, let's just say I've ridden a few city bikes and turned a lot of city door handles. This went on for a while, and I wasn't as lucky as you. I was woken up by an attack of gonorrhea, plus having to admit to my doctor that I had no idea what my sexual partner's names were. We cleared everything up, and during therapy, I began to focus on my behavior. It's been a long time since I've been with a woman without protection, but I'm happy to be tested, and I have no problem being exclusive. So, are we going to try it, you and me? Vicky asked, blinking her eyes and knowing the answer. I bet it is, Martin answered this rhetorical question. Martin's supply of condoms was exhausted by lunchtime. The almost inevitable confrontation with Diana occurred after Martin and Vicky had been dating for about three months. Their relationship was very strong, and Vicky and Dallas got along well. Martin and Vicky had their own houses, but they spent every night together, and it seemed they were getting married. They went to a club aimed at a more mature crowd. There was a DJ playing music, and the interiors were designed to separate the dance floor from the tables, allowing for real conversation. Martin and Vicky enjoyed their drinks and chatted about this and that. The evening was going well, so Vicky was taken aback when Martin's smile suddenly disappeared and his eyes looked past her. She followed his gaze. Martin and Diana saw each other almost at the same time. While Martin's face became neutral, Diana's face showed a grin as she walked towards the table. Diana remained bitter after the divorce. Even after all this time, she still believed that she hadn't actually done anything wrong, except perhaps for lack of discretion. But satisfying her sexual needs with another man when her husband was not up to the task was definitely not on the list of things that were done wrong. So, when she approached the table, her intention was not to be nice. Marty, how nice to see you, Diana said in a voice that made it clear that she was being sarcastic. Diana, Vicky, this is my ex-wife, Diana. Diana, this is Vicky, Martin said, introducing her, although he would have preferred not to. Nice to meet you, Diana. I've heard a lot about you, Vicky said. Well, I've heard absolutely nothing about you, Diana answered bitterly. We are divorced, Diana. It's been over a year now. My life is no longer your business. Now, if you don't mind, Martin left the line hanging, but the implication was that he was clearly inviting his ex-wife to leave them alone. Oh, of course, Martin. I wouldn't want to disturb your date. 
But, Vicky, there is something I need to tell you. And what could it be? Vicky asked, glancing at Martin before looking back at Diana. You probably won't want to mess with him. We got divorced because he couldn't do it anymore, Martin just shrugged. It was Vicky's game. Diana thought she had them in her hands, that she had thrown a monkey wrench into Marty's relationship like he had done with her and Bill. She was going to enjoy this. However, her happiness was short-lived. That's good then, because if that thing I was bouncing on last night wasn't aroused, then a real erection would probably kill me. Diana's smile immediately disappeared. Vicky and Martin exchanged glances that slightly mocked Diana's sad attempt to come between them, and Diana simply looked confused. Wait, what is she talking about, Marty? You don't mean to say that the damn thing works, do you? It seems that during rare meetings, Dallas did not inform her mother about Martin's personal life, like a champion. Diana, just as good as always, but how is this possible? Have doctors found a cure? Martin and Vicky were silent, allowing Diana to get even more excited. Come on, Marty, this problem ended my marriage. I think I at least deserve to know what was wrong. The smile disappeared from Martin's face. First of all, Diana, it was your behavior that ended our marriage, not my condition. You made the choice to do what you did, not me. Secondly, you don't deserve. We are divorced, and my affairs are just my affairs. Come on, Marty, you can blame my choice all you want, and I can't say you're wrong. But I wouldn't do this if everything was normal, okay, Diana? It just happened. The doctors think that whatever the problem was after I had that first accident, it just needed time to recover. If you had been patient and stayed with me through my illness like our vows said, we would still be married. Diana's mouth dropped open as she tried to think of what to say. This information shocked her. I cannot believe this. God must really hate me, she muttered. What was it? Diana asked, her eyes sparkling. Nothing, nothing at all. So now you know. Could you please leave us for the rest of our evening? Diana stood thoughtfully for about 30 seconds, then looked Martin in the eyes. You're right, Marty. I'm sorry. I was wrong to do what I did. I was short-sighted and selfish. I should have been stronger. I ruined a good marriage. I'm really sorry. Diana turned and left, not only from the table, but also from the club itself. Martin and Vicky watched her go until she was out of sight, actually feeling sorry for her. Martin then turned back to Vicky. Let's dance, my love. Six months later, Martin and Vicky got married.